uh, two quick uh, items before I go to God's word. Number one, uh, Pastor Jesse mentioned a book. I just wrote this book, Healing Power, and the subtitle is Miracle Healing for You and Through You. If you need healing, you're going to discover some things there that will spark your faith, uh, but also it is my intention to make healing simplified. Every believer, you can pray for the sick, and it just gives very practical steps of how you can pray for people. One of the unique things that I put in this is all through the book, not only are there uh, photos and actual examples of miracles, both from mine and my father's ministry, but there are QR codes. If you put your, your phone over that, it will take you to videos. You'll see video examples of actual healing, and then there also is prayer at the end. If you know someone's sick, at the end there's a prayer that they can receive prayer as well. So that is now available on Amazon in print and uh, Kindle. You can get that if you order. If you have uh, Prime, you can have the print copy within two days. Our copies here will be here in about a week and a half. And so if you uh, keep that in mind, Audible will be available uh, this week, the coloring book version the following week after that. <laughs> And uh, so, but it's going to be a blessing, and I, I encourage you to be part of that. One other thing before I go to God's Word, I'm doing this series called Memorial Stones and, and uh, talking about the history of our fellowship. I, I need your help. I want to include in the, uh, in the lessons, I want to include photos uh, of our history. If you have photos, I need you as quickly as possible to, to start putting these together Starting Wednesday night, if you bring your photos before church, we're going to have someone uh, out at the media counter. You can give them uh, your photos before church. We will instantly scan them. By the time you leave, you can have your photos back so they're not going to get lost. And you'll have them scanned on a jump drive. And so I need these, especially any of you that you were here from the early days. If you have any photos from the early days. If you bring them three months from now, after we're, we've already moved on into the 80s or 90s, then uh, they're not going to do us much good. But these are history. They must be preserved. And so if you do that starting Wednesday night, that means today, start getting your photos, start digging them out, and then you can start bringing them on Wednesday. Praise God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Uh, sometime back, I went... Uh, into a Circle K, and it was just so noticeable to me the people working behind the counter were uh, a little older, and they did not look very happy. Clearly, they were not happy. I don't know if that's just working at Circle K or life in general, but, but the thought occurred to me, looking, these people, I bet when they were getting ready to leave high school, I bet they didn't think this is where they were going to be. I bet it wasn't high on the list. I don't, I don't think they told the guidance counselor, I really want to work at Circle K for the rest of my life. So in other words, life turned out different for them. A man named J. Wallace Hamilton had a very powerful quote I want to read you. It said, every person's life is a diary in which he or she means to write one story, but they're forced to write a different one. That is a very powerful uh, truth in life, is that life often makes you write a different story than you were intending. The scripture that we're going to read is an actual life story about three ladies who life turned out differently, and they have to write a new one. They have to write a new story of their life, and that is a truth and a possibility for every one of us. We have to do that correctly. I want to preach about rewriting this story. Ruth 1, we're going to start reading at verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah Winfrey kissed her mother-in-law. <laughs> oh, just seeing if you're paying attention there. Some of you were zoning out, and I just woke you up. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and, her, and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her, rewriting the story. Let's begin. I want to talk about a different outcome. Every person in life has dreams or plans of the way that life should be or the way that things should go. And they're almost always good plans, right? I don't think anybody in life is choosing, you know, in life I, I will take the poverty plan or the failed business plan or the sickness or relatives dying plan. That's, we always choose good, right? Fairy tales and they all live happily ever after. That's, that's true of human nature for people. That is how we live and our expectations in life. Then we get saved. We are now in relationship with God and we often now bring our dreams and our plans. For some of us, our dreams and plans modified because we're no longer involved in sin, but yet we still have dreams and plans and expectations in life. And often we now approach life maybe with some wrong ideas. Maybe we're thinking, because I am now serving God, God will prevent anything bad from ever happening to me because I'm doing right, I'm a child of God. Or maybe because we think, because I'm serving God, everything I do will be blessed, everything I touch will be successful, whether that is money, marriage, ministry, children, whatever it might be, we have plans for good in life. Our text tells of three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. And no doubt all of them had plans and dreams. Naomi got married and she had two sons. No doubt in her mind, the Jewish culture, my sons are going to get married, they're going to live close to us, I am going to see my sons grow up, I'm going to see my grandchildren, we're going to have a good and a long life. Orpah and Ruth, they were not Jewish, but they married Jewish boys, they married into the family of God. And uh, they were thinking to themselves, my life is now tied, my life is connected to this Jewish family. I am going to, they, they no doubt were in love and they planned to have a long and happy marriage and raise their children. And now because they're married to Jewish boys, we're going to do this, we are going to be serving God, plans and dreams and expectations. But the story of these three ladies shows us something that's true, not just for them, but it's universal. Life rarely goes according to plan. James 4.14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Naomi and, husband, uh, Naomi and her husband, rather, the book of Ruth begins with a famine that comes to Israel. They have no way to eat. And so they decide to move to another country in order to survive. In the new country, the boys marry. And now they start a new life. This is going to be in a new location. Naomi and her husband are thinking, grandchildren, good life in the new place. Tragedy strikes. Her husband dies, and now she's left a widow. Then both sons die. The same situation for her now applies to her daughters-in-law. They are widows, and in those days there's no pension. Plus, Naomi's a foreigner. There's no children, there's no grandchildren, there's no way... They didn't see that one coming. Orpah and Ruth 
are now in the same situation as their mother-in-law. They had made a commitment. By marrying into the family in the Jewish culture, you are making a family commitment. It's not just, I love this boy. I'm making a family commitment. Our life is tied. And now they're tied to a lady who has no way to support them. See, the Bible is an honest book. If you ever talk to somebody and they say, yeah, the Bible is a bunch of made up stories. It's a fairy tale. Who would write a fairy tale like this? You would only put in good stuff and you came to Jesus and everything was perfect. It never rained on your parade and your tires never get flat. But that's not what happens. Here is the reality of life and the Bible includes painful stories. That's how you know it's true. And it's filled with painful stories that make you ask the question, one of the greatest questions in all of life is, why? Why? Why did this happen? Why does the Bible include painful stories? You know why? It's for us so you can be somewhat prepared. I'm, I'm not trying to bum you out on a Sunday, but your life is going to turn out differently than you thought. Your life is going to have disappointment at some point. I love life, but it's different than I thought. Your life is going to have pain that you never saw coming. And God includes these stories so you'll be prepared. There's a, a book I read years ago. It's called Deep Survival. It simply examines tragedies in life uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, plane crashes, all kinds of things, and ask the question, in every disaster in life, there are some people that die and some people that live. Why? Why? Why do these people live and these people die? And what they learned, the people that die the most are the people in the middle of tragedy, they freeze. The plane crashes, it's on fire, and they are frozen thinking this can't be happening it is happening get out the avalanche this can't be it is happening and that is why God includes these these stories because your life may turn out differently and he wants you to have a little bit of preparation it's not they all live happily ever after he wants you to have a little bit of mental preparation he also includes painful stories to give us a pattern of what to do and what not to do in disappointment. Because we see in the Bible people who didn't process pain and disappointment correctly. The children of Israel, they sent spies into the promised land. Tell us. This land, God describes it flowing with milk and honey. They're, they're no doubt looking for the milk and honey taps. Where are the faucets of milk and honey? And the spies come back and they say, do you understand there are walls? Like really tall and thick. There are, there are people there who want to kill us and they're really big. This is going to be hard. And there are people, an entire generation that didn't process that. Well, we're dead. There's no point in trying. Elijah faces opposition from Jezebel. And he runs away and saying there's no point in even going on. On the other hand, there are people that responded correctly to disappointment. And they were able to rewrite the story. Ruth is an excellent response. And we're going to look at in a moment. Naomi, she made some stumbles initially. She didn't do so great at the start when life turned out differently, but she got there in the end. And so God writes these stories because you are going to have to choose how you are going to respond. Listen to this. One option in life is self-pity. One man said, self-pity is the licking of wounds. Poor me, poor me, poor me. It does make you feel temporarily better. You need some soothing when things go bad, but that's all it does. 
Self-pity doesn't do anything toward healing the hurt, fixing the problem, or bettering our lives. Self-pity continued over time makes the problem worse, the hurt worse, and causes your life and marriage to go downhill. In time, self-pity wraps a protective layer around you. You only allow those thoughts and feelings that are in agreement with your self-evaluation of poor me to seep through that protective layering. Nothing changes for good when we live in self-pity. Let's look at a second thought. Let's talk about options in transition. Three ladies, three different options of how you can respond when life turns out differently. Listen, you don't get to choose what happens in life to some degree. There are things you can plan, things, but there are things that are outside your control, and these ladies learned that. The only thing you can choose is how will you respond the old saying in life, it's not so much what happens to you, it's how you process or how do you react or respond. Three reactions. Number one, Naomi. Here's the first thing you can do when life turns out different. You can become embittered. You can make the focus of your disappointment and anger God. This is what Naomi did. Life turned out, I, I didn't see this coming. Why did God do this to me? In other words, God is the one who caused my problems. Ruth 1, 20 and 21. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. That's what her name literally means. She says, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. When I left here, I had plenty, but the Lord brought me back without a thing. Why call me Naomi or pleasant? when the Lord has condemned me and sent me this trouble. God did this. God wrecked my business. God wrecked my marriage. God killed my relative. It's his fault. Or there are people, they don't quite go that far, but they say, why did God let this? Okay, he didn't do it, but he could have stopped it. God knows everything, right? He knew this was coming. Why didn't he prevent it? Why didn't God warn me when I was thinking of marrying them? He's a loser. Oh, thank you. For some of you, he actually did, and you said, la, 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 la. <laughs> That's another sermon. I'll, I'll get to another day. For Naomi, and, and I'm only going to dwell on this just for a minute in passing, some things in life are totally not your fault, out of your control. That's not true in Naomi. Naomi and her husband disobeyed God. They're in Moab. They had no business being in Moab. That was in disobedience. They would not trust God. And when her decision didn't work out well, she's mad at God. So conveniently, when she says, why God and God did... but. You helped. It was like the old commercial shake and bait. You helped. You had a part to play in this. This is what happened. There are people, they choose badly. Why did God let my marriage? You chose the Antichrist. Well, come on. God didn't choose them. You did. You ignored the warning sign. Remember how everybody around you said, this is a bad idea? And you said, no, no, I think it's God. Okay, so that means you contributed. You neglected God. You didn't tithe. You overspent. You acted like a selfish jerk. And now you're upset? So that's not fair when you blame God for things that are, you contributed. But I want to tell you, you can have disappointment and pain even if you do everything right. Some of you have the idea, if I do right, if I stay perfectly within the lines, then nothing bad will... No. Bad things happen to good people. A mark of anger at God is distance in relationship. John eleven twenty. 20, as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary stayed sitting in the house. This is what happens to people. Life turns out differently. There's, a, there's pain. There's a problem. And now they start missing church. They stop praying. 
in worship. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Brian said, let's all worship God. Let you worship God. Life sucks. I don't feel like worshiping God because there's distance between you and God. There are some people, they turn away from God completely. Some are in the house of God, resenting the God of the house. And some turn away completely. I've known people that they backslid. When life turned out differently, their answer was, then why serve God? What good does God do for me so I just won't serve him? Orpah, here's the second woman, the second option. When life turns out different, you can quit. Orpah began well. She married one of God's children. The story that we read or the verse we uh, read uh, tells about this, that even after the tragedy, her initial response, she means well. Ruth 1.10, they said to Naomi, surely we will return with you to your people. So they made a family commitment, marrying into the family. Their husbands die, and they say, all right, we made a commitment. We're, we're going to stick with you. Good, I, I'm going to keep on doing right. But now she begins to face the painful reality of a new existence. Your life because it is different now, it has new difficulties. Naomi says, who are you going to marry? Oh, yeah. This is not impossible. This wasn't saying, there's no way anybody would marry you. That's not what she's saying. She's saying, life is going to take work now. It's going to be harder. Your new situation means it's harder than it was. There's new difficulties. There are people, the, how life turned out differently was because of sin. Because of their sin, now they're working through shame. They're embarrassed. There are people who probably should be here and want to be here this morning, but they're embarrassed. Because in their mind, the moment they come in, it's going to be like the room's going to go quiet. Oh, they're here. That, that's in their head. That's not the way it is at all, but that's what they think. And why are you here? Oh. So they don't want to work through embarrassment. There are people that don't want to work through the fact they have to rebuild trust that they damaged. And so Orpah is like many people, men and women, Orpah chooses to bail out and quit. What she feels is, yeah, I did make a commitment before, my new situation changes my previous commitment. I was going to live for God. Yeah, I meant it. I lifted my hand. I said, yes. I did believe that God wanted me to be with his people, but that was before the trouble. And this is often what people think. Yes, I, I said, I'm going to live for God till I die, but that was before the sickness. That was before the financial reversal the financial pressure. That was before the ministry situation changed. And so Orpah's answer is new situation, new actions. I'm not going to do for God what I said I would do back then. And it makes sense because look at my situation. Ruth Third woman, third option. Ruth said, you can adjust and commit yourself to God. See, life is filled with adjustments. This, this is very important. I know very few people who life has gone exactly according to their plans. So Ruth says, you know, I didn't plan this. I didn't want this. But this is my new reality, so I am going to adjust. I'm going to adjust my thinking. I'm going to adjust my expectations. I'll adjust my actions if ne necessary. You know, in life, inflexibility 
is dangerous. I remember the first time I was on a jetliner, big, big airplane, I looked out and I noticed that the wing was moving and I thought, we're gonna die. No, you want the wing to flex because things that are rigid and inflexible, they don't work well. There are people, you have OCD in life, emotionally. You want everything to be in neat rows. Oh, relationships are difficult, aren't they? Because people aren't in neat rows. I, I want life to turn out like, it, it kind of line up. But it doesn't. You know what life does is, okay, this is the new reality. We adjust. That's what marriage is. When you get married, you, you think it's going to be like this. It's, it's nothing like you thought. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just different. You adjust, and that is what Ruth did very well. A man named Ian Usher, he was an Aussie, he was so disappointed with his life in 2008, he sold it on eBay. His marriage fell apart, and after his marriage fell apart, he put on eBay his life, he said, you can have my house, my car, my motorbike. You can have everything in my house. He sold it for 305000 Australian dollars. Why would you do that? Ian Usher said, I've had enough of my life. I don't want it anymore. He got $305,000. He started traveling the world with a bucket list of 100 goals. Because he thought life is over, but to Ian's surprise... He met a woman and fell in love and found love again, wrote a book, got a movie deal. It's like, wow. It was different. It doesn't mean it's bad. He had to adjust. Final thought, let's talk about rewriting the story. Ruth is an amazing example of commitment. This is the problem for many people. They are not willing to commit. That's why people shack up and live together. It's just a piece of, if it's just a piece of paper, get the paper. They don't want to commit. What they want is they want the ORPA uh, option. Things don't work out. I can bail out easily. They do this with jobs. They do this with relationships, marriages, businesses. Ministries, unfortunately, even salvation. But Ruth made a commitment. The word commitment means pledge, promise, or obligation. It's something that is binding. She had made a promise. So now life, never saw this one coming. And so what does she do when life turns out differently? She says, I'm going to stick to my promise. What I said, I'm going to still do. Maybe that's what God had showed her. Verse 16 through 18, Ruth said, don't beg me to leave you or stop following you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Your people be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I'll die and be buried. May the Lord punish me terribly if I don't keep this promise. Not even death is going to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth Lee had, Ruth Lee, Ruth had, firmly made up her mind to go with her. She stopped arguing with her. This is amazing. She says, look, life is different. I'm not changing my commitment. Time doesn't change my commitment. Disappointments, they don't change my commitment. Commitment doesn't hold you back. This is what people think. If I make a commitment, it's going to hold me back, then I'm going to miss out on all these good options. Commitment holds you in place long enough for God to help you. Because it takes time for God to work in your new situation, for a change and a miracle to occur. Listen to me, if you get nothing else out of this sermon, please pay attention to this next sentence. The most important commitment you can ever make in life is to honor God. That was good, write it down. The most important commitment you can ever make in life is to honor God. The word honor means to show value 
or worth. To honor God means you show by your actions and your attitude that you value God. I chose God thinking it was going to be one way, and it's not. But I'm still going to honor God. I'm going to show that I still value Him. I'm still going to worship God. Listen, worship is a sacrifice. Sometimes you come to church, if you feel like, you know, there's tingles on the inside, praise the Lord. But sometimes you've got to praise the Lord when your heart is breaking. When your brains are scrambled eggs. I am still... Sometimes I praise the Lord like this. I am still going to praise the Lord because he's worth it. He is still deserving of my prayer. I'm going to honor him by my worship. I'm going to serve God. I'm still going to do the will of God to the best of my ability. That's honoring him. I'm still going to trust God. Job said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And Ruth said, I am still going to be a blessing to other people. Verse 16, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She did not say, if I stick with you, what are you going to get? Do you have hidden bank accounts when we get back to Israel? No, no, no. It's not what am I going to get. She said, how can I be a blessing that is powerful when life turns out differently than you planned honoring God says I am going to be a blessing God first of all to you and second of all I want to be a blessing however I can to other people that's the opposite of self-pity And then Ruth is saying, I am still, I want other people to have a good opinion of God through my life. There's something powerful about people, unsaved people, when they see God's people still doing right, it makes impact. Because sinners are, life is good, I'm happy. Life is bad, I'm depressed, I'm gonna get drunk. When they see believers like, you're, you're still going to carry on with a good attitude? You're still going to... Why? Because they don't have that. So sometimes we have to rewrite our story by honoring God, and when we do, it does powerful things. Rewriting your story to honor God pleases God. That is the ultimate thing that you should want in all of life. Ruth meets a man named Boaz. I don't get a whole lot into typology and symbols in the Bible, but Boaz is a type or a picture of Jesus Christ. And Boaz, as a type of Christ, in Ruth 2.12, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Boaz says, you know what? I like your commitment. That is, I'm impressed isn't that what you want? Listen, some of you, 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 you want to you tweet and put on Instagram to impress the world. You don't want to impress the world. You want to impress God. And then you see that pleasing God releases practical blessings, favor. New circumstances, someone wants to help her. Someone wants to bless her. Views her with favor. Direction. People who choose to do right and honor God, God direct. Out of all of the places, there was no pension those days. What you, God built into Jewish law, farmers when you cut, make sure you don't cut every little piece. Leave some for poor people to come so they can get some food. I'm going to go find a field to work and out of all of the fields she could choose, she just happened to come to the one who was a relative of Naomi who's going to wind up taking care. That's what God does. He gives direction to people whose hearts are broken, whose minds feel like scrambled eggs, but God, I'm going to do right anyway. They wind up in the right place because God helps them. Protection. Boaz protects her from attack from others. Provision. Handfuls on purpose. God does a miracle to meet her needs. Fruitfulness. 
She has a son, destiny. The plans of God are fulfilled and worked out in her life. She becomes the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And all of this came after she thought the story was over. In 1995, Itzhak Perlman, the famous violinist, he was playing a concert. He had just finished the first few bars and one of the strings on his violin broke. This is in the middle of a concert, a packed concert hall in New York, and everybody heard a pop, and the string goes off. Everyone thought he's going to stop the concert, bring me another violin, i got to restring, do all that. But after a slight pause, Itzhak Perlman signaled the conductor to begin the symphony again. Everybody knows you can't play a symphony on only three strings. But that night, Itzhak Perlman refused to know that. He played incredibly with only three strings. When he finished at first, people just sat there in stunned silence. They couldn't believe what they just saw. And then, incredible cheering. These people, they cheered. That was an incredible concert and a response on only three strings. Itzhak Perlman quieted the crowd, and then he told the people, he said, sometimes it is the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. That is powerful. That's how life is. Sometimes you gotta find out how much music is in you, how much blessing is still in you, with what's left. In the Sunday school, we are looking at our history, and I told him a couple of lessons, how my parents came. My father is the founder of our movement, took the church here, a broken church. January of 1970, how did they come here? Because life turned out differently than my parents thought. Ministry was nothing like they thought it was going to be. And in discouragement, my dad resigned a church in Colton, California, and he thought, it's over. We're going to find a place to raise the kids, and I'll never go back to the ministry again. But after life turned out differently, he found out God had something left for him. Many of you that were saved, I just had a cure. How many of you have been saved in our fellowship, our church, our fellowship? Lift up your hand. And we are here because of my parents who said, we are going to honor God. Didn't plan for it to be like this, but we're going to honor God. And lo and behold, God had something good for them after all. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. I appreciate you listening attentively. Before we do anything else, there are people that are here. God is dealing with you. You are not right with God. I was teaching in Sunday school this morning. Sin is rebellion against God. It doesn't matter what flavor that rebellion takes. Some of you think, I'm okay, I'm not like that drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a gambler. But that's just their flavor. The Bible says, for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Anytime you say, God, I don't want you to tell me how to live, you're living in sin, you're a rebel against God. And the problem is, sin ruins and destroys when it works in a person's life. Some of you, you are empty on the inside. Desperately lonely. You can be in the middle of a crowd and feel lonely. Some of you, are, you have broken hearts. Others of you, maybe you are addicted. Drugs or alcohol, pornography, sexual addictions, gambling, I don't know. I want to tell you about the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus can set you free. God has plans for you and they're plans for good. I don't know if you came because life has broken your heart, turned out different. I want to tell you, God has a plan for you. He loves you. 
But what you have to do is you've got to deal with the sin problem. If you're living in rebellion against God, that rebellion has to stop. What you need to do is repent, which means change your mind about your sin and begin to live a new life. It will take a miracle and God can do the miracle part, but only you can do the surrendering to Jesus Christ. How many people here, you're not right with God. If you want to pray this morning for God to save you, you want to turn from your sin, do this right now. Lift up your hand so I can see it. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. How many would there be? God's dealing with people. You are not right with God. At the back, thank you. I see that hand. God bless you, man. How many others? Join this one. I want to turn from my sin. Lift up your hand right now. God's dealing with you. Hold your hand up so I can see it. I want to be saved. God bless you. How many others? Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you went back to sin. There's no point in living like that anymore. Why don't you come home this morning, get your heart right with God? How many backsliders lift up your hand? I want to come back home. I want to get right with God this morning. I don't want to live another day. Thank you. I see that hand. How many others? People are getting right with God this morning. You want to pray. I have nothing for you to buy. You don't have to sign up for a class or a course. You need to pray. How many here? I want to pray and turn from my sin. Lift up your hand right now. Anybody else? Quickly. Before we do anything else in the service. God bless you. God bless you. I want those that lifted their hands. Look at me. Nobody else. You, you meant that, sir? Nod your head. Yes, you meant that. You meant that. Come here. Come out of your seat right now. I want to have someone pray with you. God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. God bless these people being honest. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Just kneel down here. God's going to help you. Thank God. God bless you, man. Kneel down. Thank you. Just kneel down right here. Thank you. I appreciate you coming, man. God bless you. I appreciate your honesty. Kneel down right here. Thank God. There are other people you should have responded. There's a, a, a war going on inside. You're thinking, what, what about people and what about the... Why don't you just surrender? Why don't you just let go? Let God help you. If there's someone near you, believer, I want you to turn to them. Help give them courage. Tell them you'll go with them and pray so that they're able to. Let's stand up to our feet. Rewriting the story. Some of you, this is where you're at in life. I, I'm encouraging you, make the right response in disappointment and in pain. The altars are open. I'm inviting you to come and talk to God. You tell God, I want to honor you. I want to do right. Amen. They're going to sing while people are coming. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. <clears throat> because he lives, all fear is I know, I know he holds the future. Oh, God. And life Jesus. is worth God help living them. just because. Let him make right decisions, Lord God. I need you to bring strength and deliverance. Lives. Oh, God, help him. I can God, help him right now. I'm asking for a miracle in his heart. Change him from the inside out. Oh, God, help this man. Change him, Lord God. Reveal yourself to him. Power, transformation. God, I'm asking for a miracle. Oh, God, you love him. Show him your love. A miracle and of grace right now in Jesus' name, Lord God. Help these people. Because he lives. Oh, God, help them, I pray. I can I'm asking you, Lord God, strengthen. Because help he them to make right decisions, Lord God. All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future Hallelujah And life Hallelujah, is Lord worth God. the living Just because He lives Sing it again, because He lives Because He lives 
I can face tomorrow because he lives. Oh, Jesus, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know, he holds the future and life is worth. Just because he lives. Let's worship God together right now. Father God, I thank you. Oh God, I praise you, Lord God, hallelujah. Yada bakare be 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 be. Yada bakare be 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 be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.